Ladies, gentlemen, got something I want to discuss with you all because it's something that some people have not wondered about, but they've wondered about. That don't make no sense. What you mean they wondered about it, but they didn't wonder about it? Real simple. Okay, let me run something by you. Okay, we have a lot of people who are of the impression and oppression, because it is oppressive, that the Earth is flat. No, there's not another flat planet in the known universe. And yes, those individuals say that we're living in some sort of a simulation and that the stars are fake. As a matter of fact, some people are saying, we haven't seen this, the moon in the last eight days. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about that. I don't look outside for the moon every day, but I do know that there is a dark period where the moon doesn't appear. And I do know that the Earth is shifting on its axis because we watch the rotation of the sun, those of us who have solar. And we can tell that the sun is taking a different trek in the sky. We've talked about it, myself and the individual who's helped me with my solar. So we do know that the Earth is taking a different trajectory. Now, A, I can't tell you the reason why that is. But again, according to the God that I serve, no, uh-uh, hold on, forget that. Let me see if I can find that for y'all. I ain't gone here in a long, a long time, y'all. It's been a long, it's been a long road. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes. Yes, it's called Ecclesi, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Now, we're going to go to, see, that's one, that's two, that's three. We can go to number four. Okay. Now, I want y'all to understand. Oh, I, I went the wrong way. Woo-wee. I do that all the time. Hold on. I did it backwards, y'all. Whew. It was number four right here. Not book number four, but one verse four. A generation is going and a generation is coming, but the earth remains forever. Hey, and gentlemen, we have people talking about the earth's going to be destroyed, but the one who authored this book says, no, the earth is always going to be here. The Bible refers to the moon as a faithful witness. It's always going to be there. It ain't going nowhere. It's not fake. How do we know? Because the powers that be are not the ones who told us about the moon. We learned about the moon millennia ago. I apologize about that. Ladies and gentlemen, for at least 6,000 years, people have been talking about the moon. It wasn't something made up. It wasn't folklore. And it definitely, pay attention, because it's necessary. It definitely wasn't no hologram. Go ahead and look at the technology back then. Well, they've always had the technology. That's what people say, but they can't prove it. Please stop doing speculative stuff. Stop doing that presumptive stuff. If you can't prove your point, I'm sorry, but run DNC and... Um, Fat boys told y'all just to shut up. Okay? If you can't prove your point, just shut up. It's all right. You can be right. You don't need nobody else to know you're right. Okay? But if you can't prove what you're saying, Paul even says it in the scriptures, you know, keep that conversation between you and your God. He'll give you the praise you need. No, I'm sorry. Let me uh, continue if y'all don't mind. Now, what I want to show y'all, the reason why I brought up the thing about the star and the moons and everything is because of this. Now, the scriptures, I think I might be able to, I know it's in Ezekiel, and I don't know exactly, well, I know it's in here <laughs> hundreds of times, this particular phrase, at least a hundred times. I know it's probably less than that, but I'm using a hyperbole, Okay. A hyperbole. That means an exaggerated statement, and it's exaggerated on purpose. You know what? Let's go to 18. No, yeah, we can go to 18. I, I, 18 is going to be a different subject, but you see how this keeps saying, I myself, Jehovah, have brought down the high trees and exalted the low trees. Okay, I'm not looking for that statement. I'm looking... Okay, I got to do it this way because I need to find it in a particular scripture of a... Oh, how did I? I know I hit the I. It's right next to the O. Oh, see, that's my fingers, y'all. I don't wish to tell y'all how tired I is, but I is tired. We had 40 90 pound bags of cement. I didn't do all the lifting, I did some of the lifting. And we redid the dog kennel. 
for where my dogs sleep. That's right. We redid it, y'all. Oh, it's not Ezekiel. It's Isaiah and Jeremiah that says it. Okay. I apologize, y'all. See? Jehovah of Armies. Hold on now. That That's one. Okay, let's scroll down and let's see if we can see it again. Because it's, it's here. How many, Jeremiah? You say 430 times? See, it was Jeremiah, y'all. I apologize. We can, go, we can go down into Jeremiah. We can go... We can go into Jeremiah. This is the 15th chapter. And see, Jehovah God of armies. Okay. Now, I want I want y'all to understand something. I need y'all to pay attention while I'm showing you this. For this is what Jehovah of armies has said, the God of Israel. Okay. So it calls him Jehovah of armies. Hold on now. I want, want to make sure y'all get it because sometimes people, they, they see something, but they don't pay attention to it. I know. Wait, wait, hold on. I'm about to tell y'all. Y'all hold on. Y'all let me tell you. Okay, this is what Jehovah, the God of Israel, Jehovah of Armies, the God of Israel, says. So, Jehovah of Armies, it, it continuously, throughout the scriptures, let's go to Isaiah, so that you'll see that it's not just a fluke, Jehovah of Armies. It's not just Isaiah, well, okay, let's go to Psalms, Jehovah of Armies. Wait, hold on, wait, no, that's not enough, let's go to Kings, Jehovah of Armies. Wait a minute, hold on, Hosea, you got something, Je Je Jehovah, the God of Armies. Okay. And then Jehovah is his name, uh, is his memorial name. Well, he's the one who said it was a memorial of his name. But let's go to Malachi. I, I, Mal, uh oh, this is what Jehovah of Army says. Okay, no, no, no. Let me, I, I had to do that to let you know it says it throughout the scriptures. Why does Jehovah need an army? If he's the Almighty, if he's the most powerful person ever to exist, why does he need an army? Couldn't he just take care of it himself? No, 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 no. You need to understand what's going on here. How important this fact is. If he is the almighty God, as he says he is, then why does he need an army? Huh. Hmm. Has he always had an army? Sure has. So why does he need an army? Oh boy, we got a problem because we need to figure this out. We, we can't just have the almighty God calls himself the almighty and says he needs an army. What does he need an army for if he's almighty? Let's find out. We, there, no, no, no. He, he explains it. He, he doesn't leave us in a lurch. We, we need to go. I, it's, it's, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to go to Hebrews. Y'all y'all know 10th chapter. Where's 10? Come on now. That's 11. Okay, we don't need... I'm not going to 10 or 11. I just need to make sure I was here. We're going to 9. Well, technically... I'm sorry. I'm in Hebrews. I ain't got to go to Romans. Yeah, sometimes it's the memory thing, y'all. I apologize. But we got to go to Romans, the 9th chapter. Wait, that's 35. There we are. We can go to number 9. But we're going to... Start here in number 8. I'm going to start with 31. Pay attention. What then? Are we to say that about these things? See, if God is for us, who will be against us? Since he did not even spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, will he not also, along with him, his son, kindly give us all other things? Who will file an accusation against God's chosen ones? God is the one who declares them righteous. Who will condemn them? Jesus Christ is the one who died. Yes, more than that, the one who was raised up, who is at the right hand of God, who also pleads for us. Now, hold on. Why, why am I showing you this? Well, there, there is a reason. It says he died for the chosen ones. That's who Paul is speaking to, the chosen ones. So why did Jesus need to die for the chosen ones? Well, some idiot decided that, well, I'm sorry, I cannot. He was, I, Adam was a prophet. Most people don't even know that about Adam because they've not done any research. And because of that, I can't speak ill of him. So I do take that back. Adam is the reason. All Adam had to do, I was just having a conversation with someone today, 
and he was talking about the experiment they did with apes, how they taught one ape not to touch a particular banana in the room, just not to touch that one. He could touch all the other fruit and everything, but just couldn't touch that banana. And then they kept one ape there and changed it with another group of apes and then kept doing this to the point to where no one ever touched that banana or whatever the item was. Ladies and gentlemen, cultural memory, we all suffer from that. That's what Adam was supposed to teach us when he, if he had remained faithful. That's what he was supposed to teach us, but he didn't do it. Anyway, let's get back to that. Who will separate us from the love of the Christ? Will tribulation and distress, persecution, or hunger, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Just as it is written, for, the, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. For we have been accounted as sheep for slaughter. On the contrary, in all these things, we are coming off completely victorious through the one who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor governments, nor things now here, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation will be able to separate us from God's love. In other words, nothing will be able to separate us. Because God would never allow anything to separate his love for his people. That's what it's saying. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how we know that's what it's saying. God's love that is in Christ Jesus because Christ died for us. Did you not read that earlier? That's how we know what Paul was intending to say. <sighs> I am so glad we got this. Now, that we have that, now we got to go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Whew. Well, we're going to go to the eighth chapter first. Then we're going to go to nine, okay? Just just needed to make sure y'all was on the same page as Uncle Uncle Charlie here. V Vietnam, Vietcon. Okay, go go to chapter number eight. There we go. Eight. Now we gotta go to the last part of number eight. I keep passing up number nine. I don't know why I do that. For this is the covenant or promise that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. Today, our day, says Jehovah. I will put my law in their mind and in their hearts, and I will write them, or in their hearts, I will write them. And I will become their God, and they will become my people. Now, hold on now. Most people will read this and not fully get the understanding that he is speaking of this group called the Israel of God. I really have been wanting to talk about that since everybody thinks that Israel over in the Middle East is... God's people, in a sense that they are the Israel of God, spoken of in the scriptures, where prophecy is supposed to be fulfilled respecting Israel, and they haven't looked up the phrase Israel of God, or the phrase Jerusalem above, where Paul speaks of the Israel of God, being spiritual Israel, being not of the flesh, but of the spirit, the spirit-anointed individuals, the so-called chosen ones. I've been wanting to talk about that, but because, and I was going to talk about it on the 1st of October, today is the 6th, and let's just say everything kept interfering with that so that I didn't get an opportunity to talk about it, so I won't talk about it now either, because apparently that is the impetus, don't talk about it. Not from those people, okay, they're not the ones controlling this channel, but let's continue. He says... And they will no longer teach each one their fellow citizen or each one his brother, saying, No, Jehovah, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful towards their unrighteous deeds, and I will no longer call their sins to mine. In his saying, a new covenant or promise, he has made the former covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law covenant, obsolete. Now, what is obsolete? And growing old is near to vanishing away. Why? Because Christ fulfilled the law. Ta-da! Hold on. For its part, the former covenant, the law covenant, the Mosaic covenant, used to have legal requirements for sacred service and its holy place, the temple, on the earth. For a first tent compartment was constructed in which there was the lampstand and the table and the display loaves or bread a presentation it's going to say bread 
Come on now, hurry up. We ain't got all day. Showbread. Okay. And it is called the holy place. But behind the second curtain, it's called the most holy, but anyway, was the tent compartment called the most holy. This had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, completely overlaid with gold, in which the golden jar of manna, containing the manna, and Aaron's rod had budded. Well, Aaron's rod that budded. Sorry, I'm 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 anticipating because I'm kind of anxious to get this conversation taken care of. Hold on now. And the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the glorious cherubs, 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 overshadowing the perpetuatory perpetuatory cover. It just means covering or. Well, let's let's get it to tell you what it means. Come on now. The place of atonement. Atonement means to cover over. That's why it was called the propitiatory cover. It was to help cover the sins of the Israelites. That's what its symbolic meaning was. But now it is time. It is not time to speak of these things in detail. See, I can't even speak of it in detail because it ain't that time. Hold on. After these things, there was constructed. Um, after these things were constructed this way, the priest entered into the first compartment regularly to perform sacred services. But the high priest entered alone into the second compartment once a year, not with blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, uh, the sins that the people committed in ignorance. Thus, the Holy Spirit makes it clear that the way into the holy place had not yet been revealed while the first tent was standing. The first tent stopped standing. This tent is illustrative of the present time, and according to this arrangement, both gifts and sacrifices were offered. However, these are not able to make the conscience of a man doing sacred service perfect. They have to do only with foods and drinks and various ceremonial washings. They were legal requirements concerning the body and were imposed until the appointed time to set things straight. There had to be, because things were not straight, that's why they needed the sacrifices, that's why they needed the law, because things had to be set straight. Someone had set them off center. That was Adam. Something had to happen to set things back in order. Adam took things out of order. You're out of order. Adam took things out of order. There was order before Adam decided to ignore, disobey, and sin. There was order. So there needed to be, pay attention, a correction of things, of making things back to the way it was. However, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things, that have already taken place, he passed through a greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. And he entered into a holy place, not with the blood of goats and young bulls, but with his own blood, once and for all times to obtain an everlasting deliverance for us. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who have been defiled, sacrifice or sanctifies for the cleansing of the flesh. Sanctifies means cleansing. How much more so would the blood of the Christ, who through the everlasting spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we may render sacred service to the living God. That is why he is a mediator of a new covenant. Okay, so why this? Why all of this conversation? Ladies and gentlemen, this is to show you that there was a plan from the very beginning. Why? The same reason God has an army. Okay. Let me see if I can point it out to you a little bit better this way. Again, remember, the original covenant, the law covenant, was designed to help. Paul says it was a tutor leading us to the Christ. It was designed to help us see that we couldn't correct what Adam had done on our own. So we received an exemplar, somebody who lived the life that we are supposed to be living, although he was perfect. So now we must do the best we can. Hold on now. Let's go back. 
to Romans, the ninth chapter, so that y'all can better understand what's going on and why. Got to get to my Romans, the ninth chapter. It says, and I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. As my conscience bears witness with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great grief and unceasing pain in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were separate from the Christ as a cursed one for the sake of the brother, my brothers, my relatives according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Now, we're back to talking about Israel and who are Israelites. We have a lot of people wanting to claim to be Israelites. Remember, the scriptures refer to the Israel of the present day. Well, let's see. Hold on. Let, let's see. Let Paul explain. The ninth chapter of Romans, everyone. To them belong the adoptions as sons and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law, the Mosaic law and the sacred service and the promises. Exactly what we just spoke of a moment ago. To them, the forefathers belong and from them, the Christ descended according to the flesh. God, who is over all, be praised forever. Amen. However, let's go there. However. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who descended from Israel are really Israel. Now, hold on now. So not all who descended from Israel are really Israel. Now, Israel, when he's talking here, he's about to tell us what he's talking about. Because everybody, got people talking about a 13th tribe of Israel. There was no 13th tribe of Israel. Jacob's daughter, Dinah was not counted as a tribe of Israel. It was not how it went. It was only the male. Now, you did have Zelophead and I forgot all of the... I forgot all of his daughters. Okay, Zelophead had three daughters. And when he died, he didn't have any sons. So they received the inheritance. But there was a special provision made so that daughters could receive the inheritance at that time. It had not been that before. So this was after this point with Moses and Zelophehad and uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, because he had died without a son, his inheritance went to his daughters. Prior to that, it had not been the case. So again, Dinah would not have been a tribe of Jacob. There is no 13th tribe. He only had 12 sons. Okay, let's continue. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's offspring. Rather, what is to be or what will be or what's going to be called your offspring will be through Isaac. The promise was not made to Ishmael. The promise and all, everyone in the nations that descended from Ishmael, they know this. Because Abraham made it quite clear whom the promise was for. The promise was for Isaac, that the Messiah would come through Isaac's descendants. Then it was Jacob. And then it was the tribe of Judah. But anyway, let's do this. That is, the children of the flesh are not really children of God. Ladies and gentlemen, very profound statement because this is talking about what's now, but we're not going to go into detail about that because that's what we went into detail about before. But the children by promise are counted as the offspring. Now, we're going to get to the point because we're trying to show why God has an army. And this sentence right here, but the children of the promise are counted as the offspring. God has an army because of what we're about to learn. Please pay attention. For the word of promise was as follows. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. Not only then, but also with Re when Rebecca's conceiving twins from one man, Isaac, their forefather, or our forefather, excuse me, their father, but our forefather. For when they had not yet been born and had not practiced anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, respecting the choosing, 
might continue dependent not on works, but on the one who calls. It was said of her, the older will be the slave of the younger. Just as it is written, I love Jacob, but Esau I hate it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Esau had not even been born. Before they had even been born, he said the older will control the, uh-uh, the younger will control the older. See, it used to be the firstborn having all the control, but it was prophesied that Esau would not have the control. It says, I hated Esau. Why did he hate Esau? Esau had not done anything right or wrong, good or bad. Pay attention. For when they had not yet been born and had not practiced anything good or bad, so that God's purpose respecting the choosing might continue dependent not on works, but on the one who calls. God has the choice to do whatever he wants, is what Paul is saying. Now, hold on now. There was nothing unrighteous about what God did. Why? Because he didn't do anything wrong. This is just saying he had a reason. Remember, God's purpose. He had a purpose for saying what he said regarding Esau. Now, Esau did turn out to be someone who was ruthless, someone who was self-centered, someone who was selfish. Esau turned out to be someone who was not really liked. Don't believe me? Go read the story of Esau. Anyway, let's continue here. What are we to say then? Is there injustice with God? Certainly not. Why certainly not? Because we're nowhere on God's level to think like he thinks. You see, he thinks 18, 25 billion, 185 million steps ahead of us. This is not chess for him. This is not trigonometry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, he is the sovereign of the universe. His thinking far outweighs ours. We can't even think on his level. So questioning him and questioning his actions, that's the potentious individuals who do that. There are a lot of people, because they've been taught so many things about the Bible and they, they find out that everything they were taught was wrong, they then believe that God is wrong, doesn't exist, or because they have been taught in school that he doesn't exist and that they shouldn't be serving, worshiping him, and all of this stuff. Ladies and gentlemen... Because of that, these individuals don't give them the credit, and they literally like to argue. And then they like to say, well, they're just going to do what they do, or that they're just spiritual. The, I, I started hearing that I'm just spiritual. I don't even know where that came from. I, I really, it wasn't, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just spiritual. That wasn't uh, a saying. That junk wasn't around in the 80s. I know because I would ask everybody about what they believed. And nobody ever came at me, but I'm just spiritual. And when I said I'd ask everybody, I'd ask everybody. I didn't start hearing that I'm just, I just believe, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't start hearing that stuff until probably the late 90s, the early 2000s. And I, I would tell them that doesn't make any sense. Well, I just believe this and I just believe that. And they would say that. It still didn't make any sense, but that's their beliefs. I can't knock it. Okay, so let's get back to verse 14 in the ninth chapter. What are we to say then? Is there injustice with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will show mercy. We're all sinners. Hold on now. And I will show compassion on whomever I will show compassion. Hold on now. Esau was a sinner before he was even born. God hates sin. So saying that Esau hated wasn't because he had done right or wrong. He was already a sinner before he was born because he's a descendant of Adam. Had nothing to do with Esau growing up and his personality and all of that. He could say that. Why? Because he decided to have mercy on the other, the younger that's his choice, whom he wants to have mercy on. That's what Paul is saying. But hold on. So it depends not on the person des a person's desire or on his efforts, but on God who has mercy. It had nothing to do with nobody else. This was his choice. He had the right to make that choice. Just like you make decisions as to who you like or don't like. 
and you barely even know the person. You'll already say, I, I don't like her. I, I know uh, I, I don't I know I just met her, but I still don't like her. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say that. So again, that's your choice. You get to do that. I, I'm not saying that you're right or wrong. Because pay then pay attention. What are we to say then? Is there injustice with God? Certainly not, because that's his choice. That's what Paul is saying. But hold on now. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very reason, I have let you remain. To show you my power and connection with you and to have my name declared in all the earth. Everybody knows about the let my people go. Everybody knows about that. Everybody knows about the Israelites being freed from Egypt. Throughout the whole world, everybody knows the story. To have my name declared in all the earth. So that's the reason why he put Pharaoh through all of that. To show him his power. See? To show my power in connection with you. Because Pharaoh thought himself to be a god. He thought he was more powerful. Thought he was the most powerful creature in existence. And someone came up and said, excuse me, son, have a seat. Now, hold on. So then, God has mercy on whomever he wishes, but he lets whomever he wishes become obstinate. He doesn't have to tolerate people being obstinate. He doesn't have to tolerate people being stupid. We've seen many times in the past where he didn't tolerate that. He didn't tolerate any disrespect. Look at King Herod and what happened to him. So give me a second. We're almost done so that I can show you why he has an army. You will therefore say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has withstood his will? But who are you, old man, to be answering back to God? Does the thing molded, the thing created, say to its molder or creator, why did you make me this way? What? Does not the potter have the authority over the clay to make from the same lump a vessel? An ashtray, that's the dishonorable purpose, but they can also make a vase, a vase, a vase. See, vassal, they can also make a vase for an honorable purpose, an honorable use, and another for a dishonorable use from the same clay. They came from the same clay, and one of them gave honor. The other one, no honor. So what then? If God has the will to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, as in the speaking of Pharaoh, and he tolerated with much patience vessels of wrath, Pharaoh, made fit for destruction and others. And if this was done to make known the riches of his, glo uh, of his glory on these vessels of mercy, the ones that they were uh, persecuting, causing problems for, which he prepared beforehand for glory, because he said from the very beginning that his servants were going to suffer even before Christ, which he prepared beforehand for glory, namely us, the chosen ones, whom he called, the called ones, chosen, elite, the elect, not only from among the Jews, but also from among the nations. What of it? It's not your choice. It's his choice. Is it as, uh, excuse me, it is as he says in Hosea. We've already went there earlier. Those not my people, I will call my people. And her that is not beloved, beloved. And in a place where it was said of them, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. Now look. We're going to stop there. No, no, no. We're going to start stop there because we need to do this, and then we're going to go on to the proving to you about the army. Ladies and gentlemen, from the day that he first created the first creature, we'll call it creature because that's what creation means, creature. So the first creature we get in the book of Colossians. Colossians, ladies and gentlemen. I got to go back because right now I had a search I did of armies. And so it was giving me that search and I need to get rid of that search. And then I need to do the all publications. And then now I need to go to Colossians. So I apologize for that. Yeah, it's one of those programmable things. And we'll go to book Colossians, the first chapter. Many of y'all know where I'm going. Verse number 85. 
I'm I'm kidding. Ladies and gentlemen. We gotta find out who we talking about. He rescued us from the authority of the darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. So we know we're talking about Jesus. By means of whom we have released by ransom for the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The first thing ever created was Jesus. But hold on now. The plan was to create many, 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 many men, many more. But hold on. What if you give them the ability of making a choice and someone chooses wrong? What now? Well, there had to be preparations. And I don't mean H. There had to be preparations, ladies and gentlemen. That's why he has an army. Because not only does he not premeditate things, like people have been saying, God knows everything. He can see the future. He can. But he's proved to us that he doesn't do that. Why? Because that means you don't have a choice. And remember, he says he has mercy on vessels that he chooses to have mercy on. See, even if he could look into the future and see that you were not going to work out you have the ability of asking him to include you so that you do work out. So that's why he doesn't do that. He gives you the choice of asking and the chance and opportunity of moving forward. But again, why an army? Because we find that before Adam and Eve, no one had ever been lied to before and no one had ever lied. But there were no humans before Adam and Eve, right? So we're talking about in a different, what, what is the word, dimension? Because the spirit world is a different dimension and nobody looks at it for what it is. They all want to think it's something supernatural and all that. No, it's not. Everybody talks about going into the ocean and seeing all the sea life and creatures there. That's a different dimension, ladies and gentlemen. It's different from this one. We can't live there. Not without some special apparatus, and there are certain places we could never go because of the pressure. So it's the same thing. Well, anyway, because he gave those creatures the same ability, everybody, they believe that they don't have the ability of doing anything other than following orders, and that's not true. He gave them the ability to choose. That's why Satan could choose to lie. Now, why did God allow it? Satan lied to Adam and Eve. Why did God allow it? Why did God allow him to lie? Couldn't he have stopped it? Yes, he could have. But then, if there was no law, what would he be stopping? Think about it. You get pulled into court on something that is not a law. You haven't violated any law. Just the judge doesn't like what you did. Is that a crime? Well, Satan lied. There was no crime. Because there was no law against lying. Even in Scripture, we don't even have the issue of lying until after the Mosaic law is put together. There was no law, people, against lying, not even in that dimension. So he hadn't done anything wrong, although he did something wrong. Why? Well, he interfered, and he wasn't allowed to interfere. That's why the punishment was for him what it was. He wasn't supposed to be interfering. So let me show you where the army portion comes out. Give me one second, y'all. We got to go all the way back to Genesis, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Genesis explains why God needed an army. Well, not why he needed one, why he has one. Okay. What? Didn't know? Oh, not that one. Now, we're going to go... Right here. Then Jehovah God said to the serpent. This is after Eve said, the serpent deceived me and so I ate. Then Jehovah God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are the cursed one out of all the domestic animals and out of all the wild animals of the field. Now hold on now. Ladies and gentlemen, he's speaking symbolically, metaphorically. He's not speaking to the literal snake. The snake did not walk on all fours. Lord have mercy. 
He's speaking to a creature in the different dimension. We can't see him. At that time, they could materialize. He materialized as a snake. This is symbolic. I'm sorry, hold on. This is a prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because he's going to talk about the future. On your belly you will go and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, hatred, hostility, between you and the woman. What woman? He's not talking about Eve because, wait, hold on, make sure. Make sure he ain't talking about Eve. The man said, the woman. Wait a minute, hold on. Hold on. Went to the man and spoke to him, became afraid, had eaten. The man said, the woman whom God went on to say to the woman. Everybody knows that he's talking to Eve. So is this the same woman? Well, let's, let's make sure. Okay, let's make sure. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Okay, and between your offspring and her offspring, he... Her offspring will crush you in the head and you will strike him in the heel. Eve, he says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your birth pain. Let's make sure of the woman that he was talking about. Y'all don't mind? Let's make sure it wasn't Eve. Because everybody been, you know, people been saying that's Eve and, you know, her offspring and all that. Ladies and gentlemen, ain't got, I promise you it ain't got nothing to do with Eve. We can go to the 12th chapter of Revelation. Sorry, we were coming here anyway. This, the, this is to get to the final point of the army. Then a great sign was seen in heaven. A woman was arrayed with the sun. That lets us know she's not fleshly, and that makes lets us know that she's not a actual woman. She is symbolic. She was arrayed with the sun. That's a big woman. And the moon was beneath her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. 12 signifying heavenly organization. That's why it was the 12 tribes of Jacob or 12 tribes of Israel, and it could not be 13. It had to be 12 because of what 12 symbolizes. Shh, don't tell nobody. And she was pregnant. And she was crying out in her pains and in her agony to give birth. This is the woman that they were speaking about. Why? Remember he said he was going to put enmity between her seed and his seed, the woman and the serpent? Well, we know the serpent was Satan. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Hold on now. Pay attention. Another sign was seen in heaven. Different dimension. Not talking about anything on earth. Wasn't talking about Eve. Look, a great fire, fiery colored dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And on its heads were seven diadems. And its tail dragged a third of the stars, angels, from heaven or of heaven. And it hurled them down to the earth, and the dragon kept standing before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male. Did we not just read that in the book of Genesis? Okay. It is because of this and the anticipation that something like this might happen that there was a need for an army. How do we know? But we're going to go one more, one more, one more, one more again. This is the final one. Remember, he has mercy upon whomever he has mercy. It is not dependent upon the one who does anything, but the one who has the power. Excuse me, one second. Oh, I'm, I'm on the wrong one. I'm in, I need to be in seven. I said at nine. I'm going to seven verse nine. Second time I did that tonight. 7, chapter of Revelation, verse number 9. After this, I saw and look a great crowd, which no man was able to number. And out of all the... No, I'm sorry. It's the ninth chapter. I'm sorry. Ninth chapter, verse 7. I don't know why I'm doing that. <sighs> I still could be wrong. It's the 12th chapter, verse 9. See, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. I'm tired. 12th chapter, verse 9. I really am tired. 7 through 9. We're going to read 7 through 9. The same chapter where it talks, talks about the woman. I was already there. And war broke out in heaven. War broke out in heaven. 
well, pay attention. Michael, the archangel, whom the scriptures identify as God's son, who is like God, and his angels battled with the dragon. And the dragon and its angels battled, but they did not prevail, and no place was found for them any longer in heaven. So down the great dragon was hurled, the original serpent in Genesis, the one called devil and Satan. It's not his name. These are descriptive titles. Devil means slanderer. Satan means opposer. He slandered God and opposes everything God does. Who is misleading the entire inhabited earth? He was hurled down to the earth and his angels were hurled down with him. And I heard a loud voice from the heavens say, now I want y'all to understand something. War broke out. Michael had his army and the dragon had his army. That's why it was necessary for God to have an army. Because Michael was put in charge of God's army. He's the archangel. That means that he is superior to all the other angels, and he's the supreme leader of that particular group, the army. That's why God needed an army, because of the possibility of this situation happening from the very beginning. Why? Wouldn't you plan ahead? I know I do. Every single thing I do, I'm anticipating the possibility of something going wrong. But if you're God and you're perfect, why would you anticipate something going wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, because he was given individuals the right to choose. They were given the right to choose. That's why. That's why. If you're going to give somebody the right to choose... What if they don't choose correctly? What if they choose wrong? What if they choose contrary to what you wanted? What if they choose to mess up your plans? That's what we're talking about. Somebody chose to mess up the plans. That's the reason why there was a need for an army. I know, I know, I know. A long way around, but hopefully you got something out of it. All right. You guys have a good day. Don't say that I ain't never learned nothing because I learned something today.